Welcome back. The video's joined us to watch the news at 10 on Channel Television, coming to you live from Lagos, a reminder of our major stories. Gunmen kill three herdsmen in southern Kaduna communities, while suspected herdmen attacks in Benue leave five people dead. Family of commercial driver allegedly slain by customs officials in Abelkota, Open State, demand justice and insist the perpetrators be punished. The Nigerian Air Force trains 81 officers and men in counter-terrorism operations. And landslide of rubbish dump kills at least 48 people near Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa. For more on our top stories and others, please visit our website, channelstv.com and youtube.com slash channelsweb. You can also download the Channels TV app for Android, iOS and Windows phones so from their respective stores. A quick reminder here that having the Channels TV and Channels 24 app will give you access to news and updates. You also have the eyewitness feature so you too can be part of the news. Just install the app and tap and swipe to reveal the eyewitness menu and follow the instructions to share those pictures, videos or news of happenings around you. Plans by the federal government to ensure credible elections in the country come 2019 are in top gear. The Committee on Constitution and Electoral Reform has embarked on a sensitization tour of the six geopolitical zones of the country. A chairman of the committee, Senator Ken Namani, told journalists after the zonal meeting for the North Central Zone in Joss Plateau State that the electoral body is doing the right thing by intimating the public on how the next general elections will be conducted. Building a sustainable electoral system that will deepen the country's democracy informs the inauguration of a 24-member committee on constitution and electoral reform with a mandate to evaluate the country's democratic journey so far with a view to fashioning out a more viable system that will serve the present and future generations. Participants at the forum appeal to members of the committee to revisit the issue of delineated constituencies and electoral offences in spite of the court's pronouncement on the matter. The electoral reform that will also take into consideration our past, Kogi State particularly, and all the states, I guess, suffer so similar fate. Where state constituencies that were delineated were cancelled. Some of the terms of reference of the committee include reviewing of recent judicial decisions on election petitions as they relate to conflicting judgments and absence of consequential orders, review of the laws impacting elections in Nigeria, including relevant provision of the 1999 Constitution and the Electoral Act 2012 as amended, among others. For the second time since President Mamadou Buhari assumed office in May 2015, the nation's foreign reserves has hit the $30 billion mark. The latest figures from the nation's Apex Bank shows that the reserves, which have experienced a steady day-on-day -day increase of between 2.30 and 2.75 percent since January 2017, closed the trading week above $30 billion. The last time the reserves crossed the $30 billion mark was in July 2015, and went as high as $31.63 billion in August of the same year, before it began to decline. The reserves were affected by low crude oil prices across the world, which reduced the availability of foreign exchange and in turn put pressure on the Naira. The rising reserves may be attributed to oil prices, which have soared as a result of agreed production cuts between OPEC and non-OPEC members. Since February 2017, CBN has been providing foreign exchange to banks to meet the tuition, travel, and medical needs of customers, thereby reducing the pressure on the Naira.
Our discussion tonight is based just on that. Uh, joining me in the studio right now is uh, Channel Television's in-house data analyst, Ababajide Ogusa. Well, thank you for joining us on uh, the news attempt. At the foreign reserves, uh, well, $30 billion, as I said earlier, in the last two weeks exchange at the parallel market has also been relatively stable compared to a month ago. Is this the silver lining we've been expecting? I don't know about silver lining, <laughs> but um, there are two lines that um, I would um, tell you are mm. perhaps um, relevant to this. And the first line is um, what the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates and Emir of Dubai had said, and that's if you want to advance, then you have to always look forward. So he talked about the future. Mm. Now, on the second hand, let's look at what the philosopher George Santayana had talked about. He had talked about the past. And he said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat, to repeat it. it. Here's the narrative. It means that the future is urgent and the past is important. So in the next three minutes, we'll talk about the past and future of the foreign reserves quickly. Now let's look at what had happened. In um, 1960 independence, the foreign reserves then was $173 million. Three years after, when we became a republic, it had declined to $143 million. So history clearly shows us that within our five decades plus um, history, mm. we've always been fighting a war. And this war isn't a civil war. It's a war between how do we improve and increase our forex reserve. The second thing we can also look at about the past is when the president came in, the forex reserves were at $28 billion. Today at $30 billion, that's a 5% increase. How many presidents in the Fourth Republic have left the FX reserves higher than what they met? And I'll share those facts with you, and I think it will surprise you. But before then, let's look at the top three performers in the history of the nation on foreign exchange management. And at number three is the former president. When um, he came in in May 1999, then the FX reserves were $4.9 billion. And he then increased it, and he left it at $43 billion. Now, that's a 765% increase. He comes in at number three. At number two is also the former president, Ibrahim Babangida. When he came in in August um, 1983, the FX reserves then were $758 million. He raised it up to that point. It was over, over $8 billion. $8 billion then it was $8.6 billion. And number one is Yakubu. Go on. Now, if you look at FX reserves under his own period, over 2,000%. Now, he comes in at number one. And what you'll notice about these top three performers is that what had happened was oil prices were high and mm -hmm. oil volumes were also high. So it clearly tells us that our foreign exchange success is tied to oil price and tied to oil volumes. And in the future, we need to now look at how do we get the FX reserves back to our all-time high point, $62 billion, September 2008? Can we achieve that mark again? And there are two arguments. There are some that say, yes, we need to achieve that $62 billion mark that we achieved in September 2008 because it provides some level of price stability. However, there's a second school that narrates that the evidence shows, which is also um, available, that between May 1999 and date, mm -hmm. there's no correlation between increasing FX reserves and a stable exchange rate, Naira dollar exchange rate. So the days ahead will be clearly important to see what the decision from the Apex Bank will be. So will lower imports uh, be better for our foreign reserves management? Perhaps not, because I think we even need to import even much more, more. And even going by the government's economic recovery blueprint, it states that our value of infrastructure to GDP is only 35%. Compare that to Brazil, India, and China, where it's approximately 50, 60, and 80%. The summary is we need to import more, but we don't need to import refined petroleum products. We need to import technology. We need to import products, production um, manufacturing equipment, and we also need to import good ideas. And will this enhance the value of the Naira in any way? 
Um, we, we don't expect that the exchange, the, the reserves, will directly correlate to improved value of the naira. But we know that there are psychological benefits of a higher reserves. And um, right now, uh, foreign reserves covers 12 months of import cover. So it does give um, a lot of um, a lot of comfort to foreign creditors. It does give a lot of comfort for trade um, as well. But what it really boils down to is what is the connection between the foreign reserves and the standard of living for families. And that's the connection families really, really want to, to find, to be able to see that as the foreign reserves are growing, standard of living and especially poverty rates decline. I guess that's a question I have to pose at you. Does the rising foreign reserve provide families with any hope that their lives will get better? Um, Perhaps it does, um, but what we expect is where the hope really lies is not the foreign reserves. Where the hope lies is in the document that the government just recently released. So there are some things that are in that document that are positive, and there are some things that gives us hope that, yes, the standard of living will improve. So, for instance, there's a plan to reduce the unemployment rate. There's a plan to reduce even the inflation rate to 9.9% single digit, but that wouldn't be happening next year. That's a plan for 2020. So going by the plan of the economic recovery blueprints, yes, um, there's hope for an improved standard of living and welfare for Nigerian families, but the foreign reserves might not be our key out of um, this um, way of improving the welfare for families. Babaji Dogusso, it's always a pleasure having you on the News at 10. Well, the story is now amending the laws on power generation, transmission and distribution may be the best approach to solving the country's electricity problems. The Senate President Bukola Saraki made this observation during a guided tour of an energy self-sufficient village in Germany. He says the National Assembly has amended the laws to allow communities generate energy and to allow creativity and the involvement of the private sector. Our correspondent Linda Kigbe reports. A vast land littered with wind turbines and panels silently rotating from the force of the wind. This is the energy self-sufficient village in Fildheim, a community located 70 kilometers outside Berlin, Germany. The 145 residents in this community are supplied with heat and electricity from renewable energy power plants, namely the wind farms and local biogas plants. The success story of this energy self-sufficient village has drawn Senate President Bukola Saraki and some federal lawmakers here to learn how this community conceived and implemented this project. Or, or, uh, um, a photo In an interview with Channel's Television, the project leader says Nigeria would benefit from switching to renewable energy for electricity generation. Of course, you can be inspired from this from this uh, model and uh, find your find your own way in your country using your resources. May it be wind or, or hydropower or solar power. So whatever you have in your country in your place. Nigeria, with its persistent problem of supplying sufficient electricity and thousands yet to be connected to the national grid, the success story of this energy self-sufficient village may be the way to go to handle the energy problems in the country. In trying to find a solution to our power problem, we might start thinking about decentralization, um, looking at what we've seen here where community itself have decided to use renewable gas here, wind turbines here, to be able to produce uh, uh, energy for themselves, use part of it and also put some back into the, into the um, national grid. Um, if we can do that, whether using solar or even using wind, <clears throat> as we've seen here, and more importantly, decentralized, maybe that might begin to address some of the issues. Because of the energy problem that we're having, we're also looking at finding a way of doing upgrade solutions for um, universities, hospitals, schools, and uh, of course, individual homes. And the kind of solution that we're seeing here is very, very necessary for us to try to adapt to uh, what we have in Nigeria. Nigeria is already exploring renewable energy for incremental power generation in the country. The federal government is embarking on an incremental power drive with wind power being developed in Kasina and the Gurara, Chiruru and Kashimbila hydropower projects. 
This energy mix is expected to improve electricity supply, but this would largely depend on the seriousness of government in completing the projects. Linda Akibe, Channels Television News. And the News at 10 returns. Our community report tonight focuses on rebuilding of schools damaged or destroyed by insurgency in Yobe State. Please join us again.